His words are now from the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, the Lord, my strength, and my redeemer. Amen. Well, as we know, today is the seventh Sunday after Trinity, and we continue that long journey of living out the reality of our salvation in our sanctification, which, as I preached recently, it's not a sprint, but a marathon. We have to take the long view of our sanctification because we have a whole life to practice that. Thus, we continue in that season of growth, which is signified by the color green, which is the color of growth. But however, as we especially might remember growing up, uh, having those growing pains, uh, sometimes we experience those same growing pains spiritually whenever we are confronted with the righteous requirements of the law. And in today's epistle, the Apostle Paul contrasted servitude to sin with servitude to righteousness. So let's talk about the use of the word servant as we see it rendered in the King James Version or where it reads uh, slave in other English translations. Now that word uh, servant or slave is from the word doulos, which typically means a male slave as an entity in an ancient socioeconomic context. And it's male because we see a masculine case ending in the word doulos, uh, which is in the Greek behind this text. And of course we have that in today's epistle. But we also see the word doule, also pronounced doula, and more on that, in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, which is also translated as servant, but yet with a feminine case ending. And we, we remember the words that Mary spoke when she said, Behold, I am the servant or handmaiden of the Lord, and let it be according to your word. And of course, you may have heard of professional doulas, and according to the American Pregnancy Association, the word doula is a Greek word meaning women's servant. And women have been serving other women and other birthing mothers in childbirth for centuries. And they have proven that support from other women has a positive impact on the labor process. Anytime we see the word slave in scripture, then we see that we have certain biases and pre-understandings and misunderstandings, which is loaded very much with Western biases, uh, biases and pre-understandings based on the very wicked, historical, godless practice of race-based antebellum slavery in our own nation. And sadly, that part went away years ago and it took a war uh, to ultimately end that practice. And, and may that never be, even though I will submit to you that we see slavery in another form in human trafficking, especially the very wicked practice of sex trafficking. So let's definitely continue to pray against that. So in contrast, when we go back to the ancient Near East and in Imperial Rome, it was quite different. You know, whenever you saw the word servant or slave, that had a very different context because we see an explanation actually out of the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, and they provided a very helpful explanation or description of that practice. And I quote, central features that distinguish first century slavery from that later practiced in the new world are the following. Racial factors played no role. Education was greatly encouraged, and some slaves were even better educated than their masters. And that ultimately enhanced the value of that particular slave. And then, you know, because there, there were many slaves that carried out very sensitive and highly responsible social functions, uh, whether it included management of, of a household or even medicine, we saw different ways in, in which they practiced that. And we also know that slaves could own property, and that would include other slaves. And their religious and cultural traditions were the same as those of the freeborn. Uh, no laws prohibited public assembly of slaves. And perhaps above all, the majority of urban and domestic slaves could legitimately anticipate their emancipation by their 30th birthday. So that's a huge difference than what we've seen practiced historically in our own country. 
Uh, so with that in mind, if you're following along your prayer book, let's take a look at today's epistle. Uh, begin, and that's on page 198. And our text for today is going to begin actually in verse 15. I'm going to back up to the previous four verses if you have a Bible handy. So I'm going to begin with Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And this is essentially what the apostle was talking about. And this was very typical of St. Paul's epistolary writing style. And that would be with the use of rhetorical questions, such as the one that struck at the very heart of antinomianism which we would define that as being free from obligation to the moral law, which is unscriptural. But also the very opposite is equally unscriptural, legalism, which means that you can earn righteousness if you're good enough, earn righteousness by your own merit. So we know that that's not possible either. The verse immediately preceding the section ended with, for sin, shall not be master over you, for you, know, you are not under law, but under grace. So what did he mean? What he meant in this passage is that our moral decisions still matter uh, if we are Bible-believing Christians who are following the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And simply giving in to sin results in people becoming slaves to sin, especially when we're talking about besetting sins which vary from one person to the next, because we're still going to struggle with the flesh until we reach glorification as we are in our sanctification, becoming more and more in the image of Christ. But I'm also talking about those of us who do feel con the conviction to the point of being desperate, desiring to be free from the bondage of the besetting and habitual sins, which actually hinder our pursuit of holiness and not only that our assurance of even salvation itself assurance that we have eternal life in other words there are those who struggle with besetting sin and thereby struggle with assurance earlier in verse 17 we read but thanks be to god that though you were slaves of sin you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed the apostle even though he did not actually establish that original church in Rome, that mission, that church plant, if you will, he was confident that those who had preached the gospel there and discipled the converts instilled the apostolic teaching that had been taught since the birth of the New Testament church, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And since we, as God's people, were set free from sin, we are now slaves to righteousness, as we read in verse 18. So with that, let's pick up now in verse 19. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness so now present your members as, as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification and this is where the apostle reminded the church and reminds us the church that the former impure and lawless lives were marked by slavish obedience to even greater impurity and lawlessness which we identify as the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. And I read, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things as you please, that you please. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And as you can see by the nature of that list, it doesn't really set one sin over the other because it's all that which falls short of God's perfect standard of holiness and righteousness in our thoughts, words, actions, and attitudes. So as a natural consequence, continuing to do such things results in being enslaved to that former life, that former life before Christ, and leaves one feeling defeated, or even worse, questioning their eternal destiny. And that is why we are to continually examine ourselves and to make our calling and election sure as both saints peter and paul said respectively so if any of us are worried that we may have crossed the line and maybe imperiled our eternal destiny be encouraged if you cross that line you wouldn't care the fact that you care the fact that we care when we feel conviction is an indicator that the Holy Spirit is working in each and every one of us. And that's a good thing. However, we should all desire growth, to grow in the Lord, and that besetting sin actually hampers our growth. So there is a better way, and that is to ask the Lord in prayer to reveal and to deliver us from any of the besetting sins that enslave us to unrighteousness. And also by filling us with the Holy Spirit and empowering us to live lives marked by the fruits of the Spirit. And that can only be wrought by the Holy Spirit working in us. We just can't do it in our own strength. In Galatians 5, 22 through 24, we read about the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law now those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires victory over besetting sin yields fruit that is consistent with a penitent life and that actually brings us closer to jesus as we walk with him in our sanctification and that is where we even have a greater sense of the Lord's presence in our lives. So if any of us ever feel that God is far off from us, then, well, who moved? God didn't move. We moved. And we cannot experience victory over the flesh in our own strength, but again, only by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. We all have areas of struggle, and we all have areas of victory, we all have areas where we've experienced growth. So let us all take our struggles to the Lord in prayer, seeking his grace and mercy, which is paid for at the cross. Take advantage of private confession if you want to see me. Or if we have another priest on board, he's not here today, Father Michel, see, see him if you want uh, to have your confession heard. The deacon will pray for you. Any one of us among us will pray for us because we need each other to walk together as we grow together in community and in holiness. And it's all very good for our sanctification and our growth because this is the sanctification that actually leads us to that greater assurance of eternal life. And we pick up at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death,
but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is a very good verse to memorize, a very good evangelism verse I might have. Verse 20 essentially means that to be a slave of sin, Paul affirms, is to be free from the control of righteousness. That's not what we want. Under the circumstances, this is a most undesirable freedom. And there would be a misunderstanding to interpret these words as meaning that a sinner has no obligation to the righteous requirements of God's law. The intent is simply this, to maintain that one cannot serve two masters. Each bondage is so rigorous and so exacting that it demands the whole of one's attention. Ultimately, those under such bondage to sin, apart from Christ, have only death to look forward to, and without hope, without peace, without certainty or joy, but only pain. And there is nothing more joyful than being at the side of a dying believer who's ready to run to the arms of Jesus, just like Carol Lynn ran to the arms of Jesus. And, and, the, and the family in that room had, had much joy in their heart knowing that she no longer wears that broken body but that she freely ran to the presence of the Lord. And by the way, as I've preached before, there's not a period at the end of our life anyway, but more of an ellipsis or a semicolon, as if to say, to be continued, because what we have to look forward to at the end of the age, when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead, is the resurrection of all who died in the Lord. On the other hand, I have been in the room of those dying without this eternal hope, and it was very sad, it was very scary, and it was anything but peaceful for the patient or the family. So I had at least uh, three opportunities this, this past week to minister uh, to families with their loved ones on a deathbed, because I'll admit, any time you walk around in a collar and a hospice, you're, you're a target. Uh, they're they're going to grab you and say, will you please come pray for my loved one? Oh, of course. That's what we do, we, we care for souls. And that's a very important time to offer that comfort. And also to share with people the reality of eternal life. So the thing is, is now that we've been set free from the power of sin and are slaves of God, we yield fruit that, that is consistent with our sanctification and we grow more and more in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because the ultimate reward that we look forward to is eternal life. Where Romans 3.23 said, For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Both of these verses serve as excellent memory verses for evangelism. And pray for those opportunities to proclaim the gospel whenever the Lord gives you an opportunity. But also, whenever we remind ourselves of these verses, then this is exactly what we need to hear in order to sustain us day by day as we walk, especially when we're walking through difficult times. And if you think about it, what is a wage but something that one earns? And, and therefore, in God's economy, when his standard is perfection and holiness, all we can earn is death, because all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But the free gift itself of eternal life is for those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. It's all about the cross. And that's where we run to for assurance. And that is where we run to in faith. And that is who we run to, the Lord Jesus Christ, to seek mercy in our time of need. Because ultimately, that free gift of, his, of eternal life is for those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. We cannot do anything to earn or deserve it because we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any of us can boast, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. But we also know that faith without works is dead, as we also read in James chapter 2, verse 17. And when we think about this, when we think about and reflect upon our epistle for today, uh, these certainly, uh, the epistle presents very challenging concepts for us to reflect on, and yet we know we can still only grow by the power of the Holy Spirit as we are 
sanctified. So let's reflect on where our servitude actually lies and ask for the Lord's help, especially using today's collect on page 198, uh, where the deacon prayed for us this morning, Lord of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of thy name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of thy great mercy keep us in the same through Jesus Christ our Lord, and to that was said, Amen. So when we approach the table today, and by the way, if you're a baptized Christian, the body and the blood is for you. Come forward. It's, it's open. As we partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, feed on him by faith with thanksgiving, knowing that he who began a good work in you, uh, he is faithful to bring it to completion. So, so trust in the Lord and the power of his Holy Spirit to deliver us from the struggles of the flesh, especially in any areas of besetting sin that remains. Amen. And we say this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive.